This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, offering My Trustmark online and mobile banking services to help monitor spending, pay bills, deposit checks, transfer money, and more. Anytime, anywhere. More information at Trustmark.com. Member FDIC. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. Ryder is a chartered financial analyst and holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. We'd like to have a dialogue today about being mindful or purposeful with your money. We'd like to hear from you. Do you choose to shop local versus large chain stores? Do you buy some products over others because of the packaging or lack of packaging? How conscious are you of where your money goes? Ryder's also here to take your general personal finance questions. Contact us by email. The address is money at mpbonline.org. Nancy is out today. So, Ryder, what uh, financial news would you like to share with us? Uh, Well, Kevin, today, since we are talking about, um, in some way or another, about we are talking about spending, I was looking at uh, personal consumption in the U.S., and as we kind of mentioned frequently, uh, consumer spending is a huge, huge part of the American economy. It's about 70 percent of the economy. And so, what does that mean? How much much are we spending? Um, So, looking back... Uh, looking back all the way to February, back when things were on the on the upward trend, we were spending almost fifteen trillion dollars a year, um, or spending. You know, for that month, we spent at a rate of it was fourteen point eight seven seven. Uh, trillion dollars a year. Um, That fell off steeply in March and April, of course, um, all the way to about 12 trillion, but it's rebounded pretty well. We're at about 14.3, 14.4 trillion dollars of spending. Um, That's, you know, me, you, and all of our fellow Americans are uh, are pulling out our our credit cards and cash, and I guess some of us are spending checks, uh, and that is personal uh, consumption there. And so that kind of ties in with what we're going to be talking about today: how to be a little more mindful of your spending, how to make a bigger impact besides just economically with your with your money, um, how to be a little more conscious about where your money is going. Uh, last week, we had our fall fundraising campaign, and we'd like to thank uh, those who made contributions. Uh, someone sent in an email that we'll handle now, uh, and it says, uh, My husband and I need to decide whether to begin investing through a financial advisor for a fee or through our insurance company for, quote-unquote, free. Uh, they have uh, put in their recommended amounts towards retirement and have a sizable emergency fund. They have a solid monthly budget that seems to be working, and they're making strong headway on our long-term savings. The problem is uh, they have an extra $1,000 that they consistently have left over every month. We personally know a reputable financial advisor who would charge just under $1,000 per year to invest the amount and give advice as needed. We also have a very good relationship with an insurance company who can also help us invest monthly and give advice, but for no additional charge. Ryder, uh, Liz, our producer, sent you this email, so you've had a chance to look over it. Uh, What would you advise uh, Susan, who sent in the email? Uh, yes, absolutely. And I, and I love this. I love uh, that she has the problem of needing to decide how to start investing. Um, she's got, it sounds like, all of her other ducks in a row. Um, so my, a couple of caution, and, and I do appreciate that she put the uh, investing through our insurance company for, quote, free. Uh, that was in quotes, not just uh, plain text. Um, my... Because that's the first thing that she brought up, the financial advisor charges a fee and the invest, uh, the insurance person is free. My, one of my first things when you're selecting an investment advisor is look at how they are paid. Um, because um, your insurance company is not doing this for free. Uh, somebody, they're getting their money from somewhere. Um, and it may indeed be from you. Um, you know, with a fee-only advisor, they charge a fee 
to the consumer, to the to the to the client. So that's you know how sounds like how that financial advisor works. That is how we work as an advisory. Uh, we send a bill to the client. They pay they pay that bill, and that is how we get paid. There's nobody paying us to um, give our product to clients. There is uh, we're not taking a commission out of that. Um, it's fairly transparent. You get a bill. Um, with the insurance company, you know, I don't know what they're looking at, but you know, it could be they're looking at insurance products, which are not necessarily, or generally speaking, not investment products. Um, often have a higher fee, um, different limitations on how you can access that money. Um, so that's the first thing I would look at. How are they actually getting paid? Um, because trust me, they are. Uh, and, and I would generally lean towards the fee-based uh, or fee-only financial advisor there. Um, a, another concern is, you know, what, what services will you receive? You know, if all you need is just someone to stick the money in the market for you and then call it a day because you're so good at everything else, you never have questions about your finances, then that's great. And you can probably do that on your own elsewhere, too. Um, it is not that difficult to open up a, a brokerage account at a Charles Schwab or a TD Ameritrade. Um, just pick a, some, some low-cost exchange-traded funds. Maybe engage the financial advisor to help you get it set up and help you develop a plan. Um, but then from there on out, just do it on your own. Uh, that's not it's not burdensome. Um, but the reason people go to a financial advisor is because a financial advisor holds them accountable to those goals, helps them understand those goals, make sure that they're actually executing. Um, because I can say it's fairly easy to do, um, but it is a lot easier to say it's easy than it is for most people to actually stick with it. Uh, so that's what I'll look at. You know, what are the, what are they actually doing for you? Um, is going to be a very important uh, thing. Um, and there are some kind of middle grounds. There's, you know, what I mentioned them before, robo advisors. Um, you know, they do a pretty good job with investing, and they have a decent amount of information out there. Um, Charles Schwab actually operates their own robo advisor, um, and, and then a large one, a large other one is um, called Betterment. Um, that, that's they've large and uh, fairly, you know, well established. Um, so those are some other things you might want to look at, but I would, uh, I would sit down with the advisor to get a kind of more comprehensive plan um, about what you want to do and how you are going to be held accountable to that and how you are going to be held to that plan. So to summarize what you're saying basically is, you know, first of all, figure out what you want from the advisor, then go to each maybe of the one, the financial advisor and the insurance company and sort of find out what they're offering. And then you can make your uh, your decisions there when you've got that information, maybe a pro and con type, uh, write it down on a piece of paper or a chart, those sorts of things. Exactly. Yes. So uh, if you go to a financial advisor, how do you find out how the advisor gets paid? Would it be uh, maybe on a website? Is it, is it information they voluntarily give out? Do you have to dig for it? Uh, they should voluntarily get out. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> ask them would be my first, uh, my go-to answer. Uh, however, there is actually a new regulatory filing uh, for, I'm not sure exactly who all this applies to. I know it applies to, um, you know, my business uh, as a registered investment advisor. It is a form CRS, a uh, customer or client relationship summary, um, or is also called an ADV part two. Um, an ADV is just the series of disclosures we make. Uh, those are our regulatory filings. Uh, sorry, ADV part three is what it is. It is the third one. Um, but that is a plain language, simple questions that the, the advisor answers. And one of those is, how do you get paid? Um, and so they would detail their kind of, uh, they're required to detail what the maximum fees they would charge are. So uh, most folks who are fee-based or fee-only um, are going to be, probably be pretty upfront about uh, how they charge uh, because, and, and you can also ask them what other, what other expenses will I face? You know, because obviously, you know, if you invest in a mutual fund, that mutual fund has, has fees. Um, depending on their brokerage platform, that brokerage platform may charge when uh, they make a purchase of, you know, per buy some stocks or whatever they're buying. Um, you know, that's, that's how these things get done. Uh, I would say someone who holds themselves out as a fee only or a fee-based um, advisor, uh, 
then, you know, because, you know, for, for instance, myself, how we charge is, is part of our business model. Um, we're going to be very upfront about it and we're going to tell you exactly what it is um, and exactly how that, you know, go, plays into your account and, and it, because it's, it's part of what we do. Uh, to hold ourselves out on a fee basis. And a reminder, if uh, you need more information about how to choose a financial advisor, we did a program about that, so you could check the archives of Money Talks for the June 30th, 2020 show, uh, and we did a full hour on that. If you have a question for our financial analyst, you can send an email to money at mpbonline.org. We're discussing money mindfulness. What does fair trade certification mean? We'll find out next. This is Bunny Talks on MPB Think Radio. host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever it is, we're here to help. Find out what we're all about and subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB public media app. Information presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. Listening to Money Talks, our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app so you can listen on your iPhone or Android phone to all of the Think Radio shows on demand. Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. When you see a product with the Fair Trade Certified Seal, it was made according to specific social, environmental, and economic standards. These products are available for purchase at Kroger, Target, Sam's, Amazon, and other retailers. We do have a caller on the line, so let's uh, say good morning uh, to uh, Becky, who's called in from Meridian. Becky, good you're morning. on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I, I try. I don't, I don't always succeed, but I try not to shop at Walmart, uh, and and for two reasons. Number one, they aren't locally owned, and uh, number two, the Walton family that also started the Walton Family Foundation, they are big proponents of privatizing public schools all over the United States. and. One of the two main forms of privatization of public schools is vouchers, which simply takes public taxpayer money that's intended for public schools and allows, allows it to go to private schools. So 90% of Mississippi's school-aged children attend public schools. 90% of the United States school-aged children attend public schools. Therefore, 90% of our future workforce gets its start in public schools, and that's where taxpayer money should be going, is to our public schools. That's what taxes are for, for goods and services that we as a society have agreed that we need and are willing to pay for. So for those reasons, I try not to shop 
at Walmart. That's my comment. All right, uh, Becky, thanks for calling in this morning. And Ryder, you know, one way that we can sort of uh, help make change in our country is to vote. But another way is to sort of, as Becky suggests, vote with your dollar. Decide uh, where you're going to spend your money. And if you have some reasons why uh, you favor or don't favor a certain retailer, you certainly uh, can do that by, you know, taking your, your business elsewhere. And what I often think about when you know people talk about voting with their dollar is you know boycotts, um, and you know those were used, those were a tool used extensively in the civil rights era, um, or what we call the civil rights era, um, uh, in the you know 50s, 60s, 70s, um, boycotting businesses that you know discriminated against uh, against African American customers, um, d boycotting you know transportation, certain you know the Montgomery bus boycott, for instance, and. And what's important to, you know, so so just doing it on your own, you know, for instance, as Becky is doing, she is not spending at Walmart. Um, and, you know, a boycott only works insofar as, you know, it, it, it actually does start to impact the bottom line of the company. You see companies responding to that sort of, um, uh, that sort of market action um, all the time. You know, companies will put out statements, you know, oh, you know, we're going to support this or we're going to stop supporting this. We're going to not support this line or we're going to carry this line. Um, but the idea being that, you know, a company operates on uh, some profit margin. If, say, they have a profit margin of 10%, then, you know, if they lose 10% of their revenue, they're going to have more. They're going to lose more of their their um, their profit uh, because you know stores have fixed costs that they have to overcome. Um, so that's how it can have an impact. Um, but kind of like Becky is doing, she is obviously sharing that message with other people. Uh, so you, you know, doing it by yourself is not necessarily going to be that productive. Um, but the more you do it, uh, and the and the more people are doing it, then the more effective it is. And you know, we have a market economy, and the market will ultimately respond to what the consumers want. Um, so, you know, so doing, you know, so that is kind of like a boycott in a sense. Uh, and I'll say if you want to do sort of it's a kind of a grassroots effort and I thought Becky was very well stated and, and why she did not choose to shop at Walmart and so uh, if you're going to try to maybe convince others uh, you know to have your argument well stated and, and well in mind and maybe that's one way uh, to do something sort of on on the personal level but again bank, uh, Becky we thank you for your phone call and we've got some open phone lines for uh, other people who'd like to call in as we talk about uh, mindful uh, spending of our money on money talks this morning uh, Ryder when you hear the term ethically shopping what sort of characteristics come to mind um yeah and and so this gets this gets interesting it's people at the most basic kind of broad level it's taking into account ethical considerations when you're shopping and you mentioned fair trade um at the top of the section and that is a company which certifies that products are made in a certain manner. You know, one ethical consideration people might make is they don't want products that are made using child labor, for instance. Um, and so, you know, if you can do the research or, or even if you're not necessarily doing the research, but you hear about, oh, this company uh, uses child labor or has been known to use child labor, you can avoid that company. Um, it can be uh, talking about paying fair wages to their, uh, paying fair wages to their workers. Um, it could be things like, uh, kind of like Becky mentioned, you know, folks who use local materials and uh, local producers. Um, a lot of people, an ethical consideration may be, I am going to buy things which are made in the United States, um, where we do have uh, probably better uh, worker protections, um, worker environment, kind of well-being of workers than you do in some emerging countries where a lot of manufacturing is taking place. Um, and you can, you know, we can quibble all day about, oh, well, you know, what are the exact conditions you're looking for? Um, but ultimately, your ethical consideration might be, I just simply want a place that has better X, Y, or Z. And that's what you're looking for in the manufacturer of the product.
you know, a lot of times I think uh, you might think to yourself if you sort of make these decisions, you know, what is my one person going to do? But uh, but I think as, as some of these things uh, take hold and spread across the country, maybe, uh, that uh, companies do react. For example, uh, the idea of impact of what it's made from. Uh, is it a petroleum product or a recycled material? And I know uh, that I think uh, some of the big box retailers uh, are talking about how they use recycled materials. I believe even uh, when I went to a Atlanta Braves game uh, a couple of years ago, the ushers uh, were wearing uh, shirts that were made from recycled Coke bottles or whatever. And so uh, when when companies become aware of concerns from the, the consumers, uh, that's when they react and, and sometimes maybe try to turn it around to their advantage, but certainly react and, and will change possibly uh, how they operate based on public demand. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So uh, as we move on with our discussion, uh, when you spend money, I guess the first question uh, is to buy or not to buy. Uh, what are maybe some of the concerns or thoughts that go in into that decision? Uh, yes, I think um, I think not to buy would be the correct answer uh, with most of those considerations. Um, no, in, in all seriousness, I, I read a lot about. Um, you know, the impacts of this ethical consumerism. Oh, you know, is buying recycled products any better? You know, maybe you're trying to reduce your environmental impact. You know, what is, you know, can you actually be buying the same amount of stuff and reducing your environmental impact? The easiest way to reduce the impact of your purchase, reducing the negative impacts of your purchases, is to simply do less of them. Um, you know, talk about, for instance, a food waste. Um, I mean, even in my house, we end up, you know, we try to be careful about the foods we buy and try to, you know, if something's going bad in the fridge, figure out how to use it in your next meal. Um, but we do, still do throw away food. Um, and so say if you, if you realize that you are throwing away a quarter of the food that you purchase, which is not a crazy, I don't know what the statistics are for America, but that's not a crazy amount. Um, then you can reduce your impact by simply being a little more focused on what you buy. Um, you know, one example that gets brought up a lot is uh, fast fashion. If you know, if you're buying clothes regularly, you know, you just want to have the latest whatever. I don't even know words for clothes anymore because I haven't bought clothes in a long time. Um, but you know, simply reducing the number of times you buy things um, and focusing instead on on clothes that are going to last longer, uh, both in a materials not falling apart sense, uh, but also in the sense uh, that, you know, they may not go out of style next season. And focusing on that instead of simply buying clothes, you know, every few months with the changing of the seasons. Um, and so reducing the amount that you buy is a very simple, direct way to have an impact. Um, both in both in what was manufactured and the kind of marketplace. Uh, earlier in the hour, we were talking about investment advisors, and I believe that we have a question along those lines from Catherine in Greenwood. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, I am just wondering, usually when you hear discussions of financial advisors and how to choose one, you hear the term fiduciary. What mm, we're hearing yes. today is fee only. Is that the same thing? No, uh, those are fee only. Simply ret uh, uh, is simply referring to how they charge, uh, and fee only. Generally speaking, that means they are paid by a fee, and uh, I think generally the implication is the fee is paid by the client. Um, so that you know, Catherine, if you came to me, I would say, well, I'm going to charge you this much money. Here are the yeah, services get you that. can get. So what yeah. is a fiduciary? So a fiduciary, and this is a uh, fiduciary has come up in the news a lot in the past couple of years because um, there are certain members of the finance community uh, who hold themselves out for financial advice to uh, to the public uh, who have been required to be fiduciaries. And that means uh, putting your best interest above their own, putting your best interest first. Um, and for practical uh, purposes, you know, often that means uh, eliminating conflicts of interest. Uh, so for instance, if I work for a company that they say, okay, we're going to pay you, you know, we're going to give you a bonus if you put this mutual fund in 10 different accounts this month. And that's a conflict of interest because 
what if those 10 different accounts, it's not the best fund for those accounts? Um, or working for a company which has financial products, but you are limited to the financial products that they provide. You know, that's so a, a conflict. the only advisor is not necessarily a fiduciary. That's my point. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily be, but I don't really see why they wouldn't be. Okay. I'm not sure. What, what questions what? would we ask? If you we can want? ask, are you a fiduciary? Sure. And if they're not, but they say it doesn't matter, like you just said, <laughs> because I wouldn't ever, you know, suggest something. How do you become a fiduciary? I, I, no, I don't think I said it doesn't matter that they're not a fiduciary. Okay. So how do you become a fiduciary? Being a fiduciary is how you act towards your clients. And the reason it's come up a lot recently is because there have been, you know, for instance, um, registered investment advisors, folks who work at registered investment advisors have been fiduciaries and held to a fiduciary standard for a long time. Um, other folks, for instance, insurance brokers, for instance, um, brokers who work at you know, brokerage houses and get paid um, by commissions. They have been held to a different standard, which is a suitability standard, which is a, a fine standard. You know, it means that they have to take into consideration um, your needs and make sure that the, the thing that they are selling to you is appropriate, but they don't have to make sure it is the best thing for you. Um, and that's how, you know, for instance, how I mentioned um, brokerage houses, maybe they have a limited product offering, or maybe they do take commissions. They have been held to the suitability standard, which is different. Um, there has been a lot of discussion on, in both the SEC, which regulates um, a lot of securities, and, uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission, they regulate a lot of securities business. Um, also, the Department of Labor talking about changing what a fiduciary is, changing the kind of rules there and making it easier for other people to, uh, for folks who were previously held to the suitability standard um, mm -hmm. to be fiduciaries. And, and, it's, and it's kind of two sides to it. One, they're kind of trying to hold those folks to a little higher um, standard, but also at the same time making it easier for them to reach that standard. So I don't love all of the changes to fiduciaries. I do love that people are paying more attention to it. Um, so it is getting more important not only to ask, are you a fiduciary, but ask them what that means to them and also ask them because I think one of the important things about fiduciaries is the conflict of interest. I think it's important also to ask, do, what conflicts of interest might you have? Okay, um, thank you. But That's it's not, a, it's not like there. a certification. It's not a process. It's, it's, it's how you are towards your clients. Very much. All right, Catherine, thanks for the call. Good question. We're discussing being purposeful with your money. Do you employ SRI with your money? I'll tell you what that is next. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Money Talk is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. 
Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. Ryder is a chartered financial analyst and holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson should be back with us next week. Before the break, we talked about SRI. It stands for Socially Responsible Investing, and it's an investing strategy that strives to generate both ethical change and financial returns for an investor. Socially responsible investments often include companies making a positive, sustainable, or societal impact. We've got some callers on the line to get to, so we will start in Beaumont with Sue. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air. Hi, Kevin. Hi, how y'all doing this morning? Good. How's it going, Sue? I'd like to ask Ryder a question. You know, when you were talking about not buying the latest fashions or something and just wastefully not being thrifty, but just kind of wastefully throwing money away. I thought yeah. that was the basis of capitalism, GNP, you know, the buying and selling. and I thought that was what capitalism was based on. Well, I mean, like any economic system, yes, it does require uh, people to engage in commerce. Um, uh, yes, uh, GDP is measured off of, you know, how much, you know, what is the... Uh, the kind of exchange of money. For instance, like I said, uh, we are a consumer economy, and at the top of the show, I talked about you know we we were you know in February we were on track to spend 15 trillion dollars in a year, um, and so that's a huge part of our economy is uh, just aggregating all of those purchases that we are making, um, and that's kind of just how we measure the statistics of the uh, of 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 the economy. Um, I mean, that being said, it, I, I don't think we're going to have a collapse of the economy if people just uh, look towards more sustainable alternatives. Um, it, now, if people suddenly stop spending money, uh, if people suddenly cut their budgets in half and just spend a lot less money, yes, that would have a, a an outcome on the measured economy. Um, but you have to think, how, what is the actual outcome on those human beings living and existing in the economy? Uh, for instance, if I stop spending money at restaurants, um, which well, I almost have this year, but that means that there are, you know, wait staff, there are uh, chefs, there are restaurant owners who are not getting paid. There are all of the people who supply them and who furnish their restaurants who are not getting paid uh, because people are not spending there. Um, so yes, in order for one person to make some money, it does uh, rely on somebody else spending money. Um, but that doesn't mean that it, it would be impossible or difficult within our economic system for people to focus on uh, maybe being a little more frugal uh, maybe looking t towards things that are a little more sustainable. Well, thank you. All right, Sue, thanks for the call. Uh, let's uh, press on. Next, we'll invite uh, Jerry from McGee into the program. Good morning, Jerry. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Look, this is a really good uh, conversation. I appreciate y'all having this on. Um, I'll just make a couple comments, too. I would encourage everybody to purchase things that are environmentally responsible, because climate change is the most important issue that is facing us and will face us in the coming years and has very um, profound implications for our economy as well. You're talking about costs. It's, it, <laughs> we've, we haven't seen anything yet. So we need to start now buying products, sending a message, and sending a message to companies that they cannot externalize costs onto the public, such as pollution that harms us. The, yeah. the second thing is we need to buy um, – we need to be conscious about buying from countries, products made in countries that have reputable human rights records. And, again, mm -hmm. I say China. We need to be very conscious about what's happening right now, particularly with the Uyghur population, the Chinese mm -hmm. Muslims, who are now being held in concentration camps in uh, Xinjiang province. It's over a million. And, uh, and what's happening in Hong Kong? which is anti-democratic. If we really want our values to go through, we have to uh, put our money where our mouth is. So uh, anyway, I'd just like to end with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. He said, if you respect my dollar, you must respect my person. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. 
All right, uh, Jerry, thanks for the call. And, Ryder, I guess part of what we're saying here, too, is uh, with mindfulness or purposefulness, you're, you're, you're not only thinking maybe about how your spending impacts your, your personal budget, but how it affects uh, th other people and, and things around the, uh, the globe. Uh, yes, absolutely. And Jerry, I do love um, the quote that you ended with. Um, if if you're going to respect my dollar, you must respect my person. And, you know, I, I think for a, a lot of us um, out here, you know, I'm a, just a, I'm a you know, 30 something year old white man in America. And uh, most people will respect my dollar and respect my person at the same time. And I don't have to worry about it too much, but it can go further because I can look for um, businesses and products that also align with my values in other ways. So for instance, Jerry mentioned environmental concerns at the top of his call. You know, I can, you know, I can find companies um, that that share my concerns about the environment. You know, I grew up in Mississippi, you know, being outdoors so much and just loving being outdoors. Um, you know, doing Boy Scouts, hunting, fishing, all sorts of activities. You know, I would love to <laughs> see that preserved for the for future generations. I would love to see that exist for future generations. And so, you know, finding companies. Companies that maybe they do some con con uh, conservation work, or or companies that you know they're working to reduce the amount of water that they waste in their manufacturing, or reduce the amount of pollution that they're doing, or have focused on reducing the amount of waste that comes out of their process. That's a great way for me to say um, I am going to make sure that the companies I purchase from align with my value of um, preserving the environment, protecting and preserving the environment. Um, um, so that's a, I mean, he, he touched on a lot of issues there. Um, we're not going to go through, don't, we can't go through all of them, but um, I think that's a very good example of how you can use, use your dollar to have your voice be heard in a different way. We've got uh, another caller on the line. So now we say good morning to Kathy. Good morning, Kathy. You're on the air with us. Good morning. How are y'all? Doing good. What do you have for us today? Well, I wanted to give a, a compliment to both Ryder and also to the caller. When she was asking about, I can't remember her name, when she was asking about fiduciaries, at first I was like, ooh, she's kind of being tough on them. She's got them in the hot seat, <laughs> you know. But I give a lot of compliment to her because she was almost like a teacher pulling rhetorical questions and asking you, and you were very patient, and instead of just giving her just a bland answer, you actually pull more out of it, and that helped me to understand what a fiduciary is now. So I appreciate both of y'all, and that is. All right. I'm so glad that you, I'm, I'm always glad to hear that people are learning something or taking something, you know, of substance away from this. So, um, yes, yes. You have some you very so uh, good callers. Good All right. Callers. We really have. Thank it's been an excellent show today. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you for your call, Kathy. Good to hear from you, Kathy. And as Ryder mentioned, that's, you know, that's why we're on the air. We're trying to uh, get some information and, and help folks better understand uh, their personal finance and make uh, more informed decisions uh, because we all know how important it is, uh, you know, to manage our money. We're talking about conscious consumerism. What are three tips to help you be more money mindful? We have those for you next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone. Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. We're glad you found our show Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Ryder Taft, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives. 
Remember, every Tuesday at 10 a.m., right after our show, you can listen live to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. So here are three tips to help you be more money mindful. One is to keep a money diary so you know where your money's going. Two, when you want to make an impulse purchase, take five deep breaths to talk yourself out of the impulse moment. And number three has really helped me keep your credit cards at home and only take them out when you uh, plan to make a purchase. As I said, number three has really helped me uh, not use my credit cards for those impulse buys and sometimes the the wants versus the needs. Uh, We've got some more callers to get to on the line, so we will start with uh, Mark, who's called in from Bethel Springs, Tennessee. Good morning, Mark. You're on the air with us. Hey there. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, so you're talking about conscientious spending. Uh, I hear the term fair trade thrown around a lot, and I was just wondering what that means. Okay, so fair trade, I, um, I can try to pull it up real quick, but essentially it, it is a standard uh, done by um, a, a private uh, certifying body. I don't know. They may just be called the fair trade group, um, but they are focused uh, mainly on making sure that uh, products or goods are produced up to a a couple of labor and environmental standards. Um, The example I I think uh, the first comes to mind, you know, because the first products I saw which were fair trade are things like uh, chocolate and coffee. And so they were focused on um, making sure that the growers of the chocolates and coffees uh, were, you know, um, pay, you know, held to a certain standard as far as how do they treat their workers, how much do they pay their workers, um, but also because those are you know farmed products or you know, the cocoa bean is a farmed product, uh, the coffee is a farmed product that they uh, were held to certain environmental and sustainability standards. You know, for instance, you know, are, is this coffee is it a shade grown coffee plantation? Um, are they clear cutting forests to grow this coffee or cocoa or what have you? Um, and so they go and certify uh, the the product that the farmers are, are making. Um, it's similar to something like an organic certification. Um, the U.S., there, well, there are lots of places that do cert- various certifications for pretty much anything. Um, but, you know, the USDA does an organic certification in the United States. And, you know, there are a few standards about, you know, when was the last time chemicals were used on this field? I believe it has to be like three years have to pass. Um, and then just kind of various uh, specific to, um, you know, organic growing, uh, very standard specific to that. Um, so fair trade is, is like that. It's a set of standards and there's a body that certifies that they meet those standards, which just makes it easier for the consumer to say, I am looking for something that is held to a high environmental standard. How do I find it? Well, you, you go and look for the things that have the, the certification, um, that fair trade is doing all the work of, for you of saying, I have tracked this down um, the supply chain and determined that this does meet the standards that we are holding them to. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, Mark, thanks for your call. Uh, Let's move on next. We've got uh, Robert, who's called in today. Good morning, Robert. What do you have for us? Uh, Okay. I thank you for taking my call. I've been a school principal for a thousand years, retired (laughs) in 2007. (laughs) And uh, During, during that time, I uh, started way back a uh, annuity, and I'll be 70 in December, and uh, I've talked to my company, and they've sent me a thousand different ways to deal with this, and they said I think I could wait till I'm uh, 72 now. I think that they said that's the law now that I can wait before I start drawing down, but uh, whether to take the uh, required reduction or to uh, annuitize, I don't know if that's the word. And, you know, it's just confusing. Who do I, who could I go to? Because my company is way far away and I talk on the phone and uh, I just want to make the best decision for me and my wife. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And, and so, you know, again, who, who could help you with that? I would say, you know, find a... Again, we have said fee-only fiduciary advisor uh, who can just kind of look, who maybe would focus more on doing a financial plan for you. Um, so perhaps not someone associated with the insurance world um, because you're not just looking for help with the form, um, although that may be part of the Correct. job. 
but someone who can kind of plan for you. And what I would look at is, do you have? Are you going to have any other sources of income in retirement besides Social Security? Oh, Will you oh, have yeah. a I, pension, I have for Social instance? Security. I have Social Security. I have PERS from the state. A pretty good chunk of that. Mm -hmm. My wife was a teacher, so she also has PERS. Main thing yeah. I want to do is be sure. Main thing I want to do is be sure if I go before she does, that uh, that she is taken care of, and I want to develop a plan with my annuity to where you know she she has what she needs when I go if I go because she um, will lose some money Absolutely. because of my Social Security and such. Yeah, absolutely. And just to, you know, for the broader audience, um, you know, a couple, when one person dies, the other person gets the higher Social Security amount. So there will be a reduction in Social Security, but they will get the higher amount. Um, with PERS, you mentioned you have PERS. They do have pretty good uh, survivor options. You know, you can basically reduce your amount uh, to assure that your, your wife or for anyone else, for your spouse, would ha or just a designated um a designated survivor would have uh, some income stream um, after you die. Um, what I would say first is, you know, if your income needs are being taken care of by your pension and by your Social Security, and it looks like maybe, you know, how, how you set it up, your wife's income needs might be pretty much taken care of, you might want more flexibility from that annuity. So, you know, maybe, uh, you know, annuitizing it, annuitizing it would lock you into a payment for the rest of your life. And it may have a survivor benefit or it may not. Um, but if you don't need that as an income stream, there will be required minimum distributions, as you mentioned, um, but it may make more sense to either leave it in the annuity and just take those and have the flexibility of drawing more, or perhaps um, a very flexible way to do it is if it's possible to roll it into a, an IRA, which you know would give you a lot more flexibility with how you invest it, when you withdraw it, et cetera, you would still have those required minimum distributions. But having some money in a, in a pot that is flexible and that you can kind of reach into at any time um, might be valuable if your income needs are already taken care of. Um, but again, you know, sitting down with somebody who can really focus on the plan and really look at some projections about where your income is going over the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, because you said you taught for a thousand years. I mean, it sounds like you're going to be in retirement for probably about 900 or so. <laughs> um, you know, you've got a long time to plan for. All right, uh, Robert, uh, thanks for your call. We appreciate that. So, uh, Ryder, got about a minute left. I thought this was an interesting discussion because it was kind of two-tiered when we talk about money mindfulness. First of yes. all, that's idea of, you know, what what is our impact on uh, maybe our community and the world, but also, you know, mindful money, tracking your money, being, being sure of where it goes. Uh, and uh, what would maybe be a first step if someone wants to get a better handle on where their money's going? What might be something that they could easily do to help track that mo that monthly spending? <laughs> well, um, yeah, and I just wanted to mention that these things, you know, even though there are the two di different impact, you know, where where's my money going in the world and then kind of where is it going out of my own bank account, um, those kind of sound like they're two different things, but they really do tie together when you think about what your values are. And that's where I like to start is look at your spending. Look, I, and this, I mean, this was my process for doing it. I looked at every single dollar that I spent and I categorized it and I looked at it in different ways and I said, what do I care about? What, it, what is something that I can't do without? What is something that I can absolutely do without? And that process of kind of narrowing down what what is it that I'm valuing and then look to the products that I'm actually getting and saying do these align with even my deeper values um, so a, a careful accounting of your spending um, is going to be the place that you start again that's a great two-tiered approach money talks is a production of MPB think radio funded in part by generous financial support of our listeners to hear today's show or previous show you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for money talks on your favorite podcasting app our show is produced by liz gill so for Ryder taff i'm kevin farrell join us every tuesday at 9 a.m for money talks heard only on mpb think radio
Support for MPB comes from Trustmark, offering My Trustmark online and mobile banking services to help monitor spending, pay bills, deposit checks, transfer money, and more. Anytime, anywhere. More information at Trustmark.com. Member FDIC. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download.